And we're live. Hey, everybody. I'm going to do a new thing today that I've never done before. It's called Drinks in Leather, and it's for you, the one person that's here. Uh, I'll encourage you to shoot uh, any opinions or shoot me some questions if you want, but I thought it'd be really fun to talk about my minimal knowledge in things like beers and maybe coffees or whiskey that I'll be doing. And I'll ex share my extensive knowledge in things that I know about leather. So today I'm gonna to talk about this beer that I really like, which is obviously great. But I also have my Roy Boots here that I'd love to share my experience on. And then I think the most important thing that I'll be talking about is these leather terms, because there are a lot of confusing marketing spin words that uh, shoe companies will use or anybody that uses leather uses these crazy terms. And uh, I don't like it. It bothers me because it's misleading and I think you should make an informed decision. So uh, again, shoot any questions you want. Uh, I'm looking for opinions on what beer or wine or anything I should drink next. But today we've got the Ballast Point Victory at Sea and my like ridiculous shell cordovan bottle opener let's see all right so i've been a really big fan of this beer um from my friend chris who might may or may not be in this i didn't give him a heads up but he lived in san diego uh, for a bunch of years and was always talking about ballast point and then we got a ballast point in chicago which is fantastic for me because i really like their beers um, so anyways, he turned me on to this victory at sea and I wasn't a huge Porter fan at all or any stouts. Um, but this one is just awesome and it's dangerous because I think it's, gosh, it's like 10, 10%. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's still good. It's uh, it's just really strong, uh, coffee and vanilla flavor that I love. So maybe by the end of this, I'll finish this. Um, but if you guys have tried this before, I think it's one of the better porters that I've had. And I would love to know some more porters because like I said, I've just been turned on to this style. I was more of like an IPA kind of guy and sort of broadening my, my knowledge of different beers. So what I was thinking would go really well, let's pair it. Let's pair, pair the victory at sea with some boots. So I've had these Roy boots for a long time and actually just wore them yesterday. And even without me taking great care of them, I think they just look cool with all the scuffs and scratches. But I have to say that they're the they're probably the most uh, most comfortable boots that I've worn. And I'm not sure if it's to credit. Um, there's probably many things to credit, but I think I think it's the last. And I could be wrong. I think this is on the berry last or the true balance last, probably the berry last, but it fits me really well. And with the Chrome Excel leather on here, it's just very soft. So it's easily broken in. Um, I, there's really no break in time at all in these. I've got a little bit of a line or two, which I'm not sure what that is. But for me, these are the most comfortable boots. Uh, so let me know if you guys have worn these or if you know what last this is on, if you've worn any other Alden lasts. I've had good luck with the True Balance last on my um, Indie boots, and those are great too. But these are just the best for comfort. I don't think you can beat this. And the other thing that might be, ooh, there's hair on the bottom. <laughs> uh, the other thing that might be credit for the comfort is this crepe sole. It's really soft and squishy. Um, so if, I don't know if you guys have worn a crepe sole, but it's kind of uh, rubbery. It, I think it is a rubber, but it's got a lot of spring to it. Uh, so for walking around, you kind of have this like springy step that I think is really cool. Um, but yeah, and uh, I guess there's been people have had issues stepping in certain chemicals that melts this. I'm not sure what those are, but if you work in... Um, an intense factory that uses a lot of chemicals. This might not be great to wear, but I wore these. Uh, they're a boot that I wore for my wedding. So I think you can even sort of dress them up. So they're really, I think these are the best. Best boots, Roy boot. I did get those Alden, uh, or not Alden, the Viberg 
shell boots that I made. I think the last time I was live, I did a video on shell boots. And those are really great too. I'm having a heck of a time breaking them in. And I think it's because the soles and the midsoles are so dense. The leather that they use is just very firm. So they're getting better and better. Every time I wear them, they're more comfortable, but it's taking quite a while for me to, to sort of break those in. Yeah. All right. Big topic. So I did a, um, what did I do? I did a Skype chat with a guy, uh, has a great YouTube channel, Robert Powers. And you should look up Robert Powers YouTube channel. He has a large knowledge of, or a large amount of knowledge on different types of footwear. And he came to me asking about leather and, um, he asked me some really good questions about these different terms. So terms like, uh, I've got my list over here, full grain, corrected grain, split, new buck, and bonded leather. Excuse me, at uh, Victory at Sea. <laughs> uh, so he had these really great questions because he his whole thing is he wants people to know what they're getting and he wants people to know what's behind just the term. And I'm reading an article right now. I don't really want to throw these guys under the bus, but um, some of their terms are are confusing to me. And I think what's happened is over the years, people have taken different manufacturing processes for different types of leather and given them marketing spin words to sell them into that product. And I think they're trying to tear out the different levels of leather. When that's just not a thing. They're trying to say this is better than that and that's better than this. And it, that's not how it works. It's it's like saying um, certain types of wood are, are better than others. I, I mean, it depends on what you're doing with it. Um, like I got a guitar there that's made out of certain wood that resonates differently than a different type of wood, but they're both cool. Uh, so I think it, it's very analogous to woods is the leather stuff. Uh, it's also really analogous to paint. So that guitar I love has sort of a translucent finish. It's got more of a stain. And then I have another guitar in front of me that has more of a paint. And you can finish leathers in the same way that you would finish a guitar piece of wood or uh, furniture to, to that effect. Um, this guitar is worth showing. <laughs> All right, so this is a guitar. This is actually an eight string guitar. Um, made by a company called Carvin, but these days they go by Kiesel. So if you're trying to find them, you have to look up Kiesel. But I think this is really cool just because of how they finished that wood. And I really like seeing the grain character in the wood. So I chose a translucent, translucent finish, as you can see on this. That's sort of an aqua shade that um, has like a fade from the edges. So it's darker on the edge and then lighter on the, on the middle. I just think it looks really cool. And then same on the, the fingerboard here, that is a bird's eye maple, which if you were to cover that in paint, it would be a real shame because you wouldn't see all that cool random look and texture of the wood grain. And that's very much analogous to anything leather. Um, so um, full aniline leather would be equivalent to both of these where you can see through the finish layer into the grain character of the leather. So this right here, I think all they put on this is oil. So we would call this in leather, we would call this a naked finish. There's no finish put on it at all. And then here, we would call this an aniline finish. Even though there are, is color put onto it, it's very transparent and you can see right through to the grain. So if you ever see a piece of leather that looks more like paint than it does like stain, for example, that would be the difference between aniline leather and not aniline leather. So reading this article here, they're saying the best leather is top grain or full grain leather. And I think that doesn't make sense. I mean, it could be the best, but it doesn't really tell you a characteristic other than it's full grain or top grain. It doesn't say it's better than something else. So those are two different terms that they're calling the best. And those two different things are totally different things. So let's go, let's break it down. Full grain leather. Full grain means that the grain of the leather 
think of it like wood grain has not been sanded down. So you can see all the little hair holes, all the pores that is full grain leather. If it looks flattened down or you can't see those hair holes, it's probably something called corrected grain leather, which oftentimes tanneries, including Horween, we take sandpaper and we'll either buff it very hard to make more of a suede sort of new buck look, or we can do it really lightly and make it more of a polished look. Uh, and many amazing leathers that Horween makes are made with corrected grain leather. So they're, they can be great. And I don't understand why they would say that something that in order to be great has to be full grain. doesn't make any sense. The second part of this top grain leather, this is the one that bothers me the most. Um, in the tannery, every animal hide is a different thickness. We get them in and we process them and they're infinitely variable. So not only are they different in thickness from hide to hide, but they're also different in thickness on the hide itself. So it might be uh, thicker towards the backbone of the animal and then thinner towards the shoulders or the belly of the animal that sort of tapers down. So in, in the tannery, in order to make a prescribed thickness, every time we have to do something called splitting. And splitting machine is where we take the hide of leather and feed it into the knife, removing the bottom section from the leather uh, of the leather from the top section. And those two sections, I believe this is where they're getting top grain and nothing. They don't really call this anything, but we call this leather and we call this a split, which is also leather. It just doesn't have any grain on it. So when they say top grain leather is the best, that, that depends because I've seen amazing suede made from this bottom sort of byproduct of the top grain. Uh, so that's hard to say too. Uh, you can't really qualify a, a good or bad based on how you're thinning down the leather. It doesn't make any difference. It depends on what you're using it for. It depends on what uh, effect you wanna see. It depends on what sort of texture you wanna see. So I think it's really important for people to understand that top grain doesn't mean anything. And for example, Horween, we only make top grain leather, which does to me, it's just leather. And then everything underneath is called a split. So we'll, we'll come back to that, but hey, Robert, uh, I'm gonna read your message here. Breaking in shell shoes. Um, just before you got in here, I was talking about my shell Vibergs that I picked up. Um, gosh, it's been about a month now and I'm having a heck of a time breaking them in. Um, and I think they're actually, what what shell shoes do you have? Because I think that's relevant. For me, the, the, sh the boots are uh, having a hard time breaking them in because of the midsole and the sole. They're thick leather soles. It's actually on a day night sole, but the midsole is very thick and dense. And I'm having a hard time getting it to flex enough to where it conforms to my foot. And when I walk around, it's not stiff. And it's my understanding that a lot of Viberg stuff has the same issue. Oh, my phone's blown up. So yeah, I think it really depends on what shoe you have. Um, I've after wearing these Vibergs, it's made me really want a pair of online shell somethings because I think they would be ridiculously comfortable. They may not have as much stand as other leathers. Like, for example, this Chrome Excel is kind of soft on the Roy boot again. Focus. <laughs> uh, if this didn't have a backer of another leather, uh, it might be too flimsy. It might sort of flop over and sort of go like this. And I think that may be one of the reasons that a lot of places add a liner. Um, so if your shell or shell boots or shoes are lined with something that may affect the break-in period as well. Something I wanna try on the Vibergs that I have is trying some shoe trees. Cause I think that might sort of keep it to shape. Cause the leather kind of ebbs and flows with temperatures and moisture. Um, so I, I don't actually, it's ridiculous that I don't, but I don't actually have any shoe trees. And I think that might be a good way um, to not only increase the longevity of them, but I think it would help break them in. So you might want to try that, Robert. That's what I'm going to try. Um, so we got through top grain and full grain here. I think those are kind of nonsense words. The second thing they say here, corrected or embossed grain. Now, those are also two different things. And I don't know why they would put them in the same basket of quality. But corrected grain and embossed grain, those are often, so let's break it down, sorry. <laughs> corrected grain leather is leather that has been sanded down. 
So as I said a little bit earlier, it's when you take a light sanding to the leather and you start to flatten down some of that grain characteristic. You might not see as many hair holes or as much of that deep, um, the deep pores in the leather. And it'll start to look a little flatter. I think it looks cool. Um, I think full grain looks cool also. So I wouldn't say that one is better than the other, but that's what correct it is. You're sanding the grain down to make it a little bit more even. And then embossing is when you put a texture into the leather using a typically using a hydraulic press with a lot of text with a lot of pressure. And at the tannery, actually, we have several hundred plates of different textures. So you can put in uh, different animal textures into there if you want. We don't often do those because I think they I think people know they look kind of fake and they come to Horween looking for something that doesn't look very fake. Um, but again, corrected and embossed, that doesn't really mean anything either. So corrected leathers, actually this Chrome Excel has a light polish on it. So technically this awesome looking boot is corrected and they're saying it's the second best leather, uh, second best type of leather because it's a corrected grain. And all that correction does is give you that little, little sheen. See the sheen on this? That's what, when we polish it really lightly, you get that sort of luster. And that's all we're doing on this one. And they're, they're saying that that makes it bad. That has nothing to do with how good or bad it is. It's just different. So, and then we'll go into emboss. There's many customers that we work with at the tannery are larger brands that have to manufacture thousands of shoes in one batch and they all have to be the same. And the biggest challenge for tannery is we have to take these infinitely variable hides that come in different every time. They're different shapes, they're different thicknesses. Um, they might have imperfections on them and we have to create that imp imperfect thing into the same perfect thing every time. And that's sort of manufacturing in a nutshell for everywhere. But in a tannery, when you're dealing with these natural variables, uh, it's very much, uh, it's a difficult challenge. So one of the things that we can do to sort of minimize the variance is to emboss it. And often at, at Horween, we'll do a light emboss and we'll tumble it afterwards. And that's something called a print assist. Uh, basically, you're breaking in the leather with that, that embossed texture first, and then you tumble it. So when you tumble it together, it starts to take on that texture. And that's why it's called a print assist. So it, it looks more like a natural, more even texture. Um, and so I don't say that's bad either. That's great if you're Nike and you have to make 100,000 shoes that week that all look the same. So I, I don't know why these guys want to say that it's the second best. I think that's great. I think it's good. It's just different. Let's let's plug Ballast Point again. Ballast Point. Yeah, this is pretty good. It's going to get me maybe too drunk for Game of Thrones because I'm a total lightweight these days. I drink one of these and I'm in big trouble. Also, uh, I don't know if you guys are ready for Game of Thrones tonight, but I've kind of been bummed out, but... Um, I'm excited to watch the last episode, even though I've been kind of bummed out by it. Anyways, let's go back to these leather terms because we the next one on here they call a split suede. So uh, back in the first topic I was talking about there where you have a side of leather that you need to get down to a prescribed thickness, you feed it through that very sharp blade of something called a splitting machine. And what you end up with when you feed one piece of leather through there is you separate them out and you end up with the top part, which we just call leather or the grain side. And then this part underneath would be called the suede side. So there are many tanneries that are fantastic in the world that make only this part, only this, the split we call it, or a suede. And that's what these guys are calling it, a split suede. And their words are functional and inexpensive leather hides. Well, I can tell you that Alden uses some leather that is a split suede that's totally beautiful. Um, many other high-end footwear companies use these splits and they're beautiful. They're very expensive to make actually. Uh, and it's really hard to get a very tight nap and a perfect looking suede, which is why Horween doesn't do it. We more focus on the, the top layer, the grain layer. And uh, again, like. I don't know why they would say this is functional and inexpensive leather. It, that's nonsense. It doesn't, a split has nothing to do with the quality of it. It's just a different part of the hide. So hopefully if you ever see something on, nobody's ever going to sell you a product that says this is a split because it has a negative connotation, but it, it doesn't matter because it looks great in the shoe. 
All right, last one here, which is interesting that they put this as fourth because I would put this as higher than a suede. They call this new buck is the fourth best. It says, look, don't touch. Look, but don't touch. Very sensitive leather. I'm like angered by this one because not only is a new buck, in my opinion, um, more expensive and better quality than a split, uh, it actually can be totally amazing looking so I, and amazing feeling. So I don't know why they, why they say look, but don't touch. Um, all a new buck is, is similar to that corrected grain. It's really that simple. A new buck is a corrected grain piece of leather. Now, you don't have to put finish over your corrected grain leather when you sand it down. Uh, you can leave that sanded open part of the grain. You can leave that open. You don't have to fill it back in. And if you leave it open, that's something the world has started to call a new buck. So that might clear it up a bit. To me, it's very similar to that split suede, which it has a really cool feel and it has a really cool suede look. And it has a really cool nap. So if you brush it, the color changes. It's really deep in color. Um, but the new buck will do the same thing. Um, at Horween, we make plenty of new bucks and they're really nice. And uh, actually one of the most popular ones is called uh, Snuff Suede, where you just take a full grain piece of leather and we sand it down and it opens up that grain layer and sort of suades it out. It gives it a really cool look. Uh, for me, uh, the reason that you would choose a new buck over a split suede as a manufacturer is if you were making something that needed to be a little bit more durable and more thick. Because again, during that byproduct, uh, the, the byproduct of the splitting phase, that little split underneath is very inconsistent in thickness. And often you don't get anything much over three to four ounces, which is, you know, one, one or two millimeters. And you can't really use that on an unlined boot. For example, you would have to use something like a new buck, um, which we can make new bucks um, up to 10 or 15 ounces. We can get belt weight new bucks and they're really great. So I don't know, again, like very upsetting to read that their description that says, look, but don't touch very sensitive leather. That makes no sense. That's just wrong. And then the last one here, it, they're actually right on. So I'll give them a, I'll give them a one out of five, 20% here. Their last category that they have is called reconstituted bonded or fiber leather. Uh, I imagine that there are other terms for this, like recycled leather. Um, but this is this is exactly how it sounds. You can take um, off cuts or even splits that I've been talking too much about, and you can grind all that up and make a sort of aggregate of different leather types. And then you can recombine them all with an epoxy or some other filler. And then they extrude it into sheets. And you can make sheets of like ground up leather that is fine. I, that to me, that's not really leather. That's that's sort of something different. Um, I don't see why they would try to sell that as leather. Uh, they should just call it something else because it doesn't have any of those cool characteristics that we all love about leather. It doesn't look good. It doesn't all the tactile stuff. It doesn't look good. Doesn't smell good. Doesn't really feel good. It feels more like finish. It feels more like plastic. Um, so I don't know why they would even call it leather. Um, Something also that I had mentioned to um, Robert Powers, uh, you should ch again check out his YouTube channel because he's fantastic. He was mentioning, um, you know, maybe they do this recombined leather because it's um, more environmentally friendly. And that's probably true. Uh, I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it's great. They should just call it something different. But there's been some new technologies that I think are really cool that I don't know is if they're really out there in the world yet. Um, so you may not know this, but a lot of the vegetable tan leathers are used, are made with a tanning solution that is uh, made from cabracho, which is the, uh, a tree in Africa, I believe. And I'm not, I should get more knowledge on this, but it's my understanding that it's not a very common tree and it's kind of not, um, it's probably not the best thing to cut them down <laughs> like any, like any tree. However, there's been some new, um, there's really new cool stuff um, that Horween is developing right now called Olive Tanned. And I could be wrong on this too. I believe it's the olive bark of the olive tree and the leaves of the olive tree that they combine into a tea. 
uh, or we think of it like a tea when you tan with it. So we are able to take the tannins out of the renewable resource that the olive tree uh, makes and they make this tanning solution out of it. And it's very similar to vegetable tanning with the cabracho. Um, the stuff that I've seen is actually really soft, but I'm imagining that we could make it a bit firmer. So there are really cool new things um, that tanners are able to do to minimize any environmental damage. And those are things that I should mention that Horween and I know many other places, uh, many other tanneries are looking at is reducing the impact on the environment um, because historically tanneries have been known as really dirty, gross places, and they were often put on the outsides of towns because they smelled and they polluted. These days, if you look on a map, take a look at where, take a look where Horween is on Google Maps, and you'll see it's right in the middle of the city. So if we were polluting, we would get kicked out right away. So we're very kind to, um, to the environment at Horween specifically. Um, for example, we have our own wastewater treatment plant and we reuse and recycle and reduce so many things. Um, having said that, there are many tanneries in the world where there are no local restrictions or local laws uh, on those tanneries. So they're sort of given free reign to do whatever they want. And it's a real shame because they'll just pump wastewater right out into the, into the backyard. And that's not good. Um, but there are auditing bodies that come through to each of these tanneries if, if they want to sell to larger brands um, brands that are being very responsible um, i can think of many but one of the ones that we work with often is timberland uh, i know that nike does this as well they hire this body to go audit the tanneries to to make sure that they're not doing terrible crazy stuff to the environment and that also includes things like how much water do you use how much electricity do you use how much energy do you use so it's great uh, and people should be aware that there are, is a large effort being made by many tanneries to improve and reduce their footprint um, environmentally. So let me see your question here, Robert. So sorry to monopolize the question box. It's, I'm so, the reason I'm doing this live is because I want your questions. So anybody feel free to jump in here and ask, because I really want people to ask about these leather terms because I think it's very upsetting to me to see people get treated um, like idiots. <laughs> so I want you to have all the knowledge so you can make an informed decision when you're buying something. All right, Robert says, sorry to monopolize the question box today. I bought a three piece shell belt. There have been retailers that sell one piece shell cordovan belts. Is this possible given the size of the piece of shell? Yes and no. <laughs> this one requires another little sip. All right, Robert, that's a really good question. Um, this is a piece of shell cordovan. Um, this is act the reason I was actually even made this, it would be nonsense to make this out of, um, if I bought a shell specifically to make this bottle opener, that would be really dumb. And that's because the shell cordovan is uh, 10 times the price of most other leathers. It's totally in a different category. And one of the biggest reasons that it's so expensive is because it yields each hide of a horse yields two small ovals that are roughly two to two and a half square feet ovals. Roughly that big. They're not big. So if you, you can make a one piece belt, if your waist is 10 inches, <laughs> it's very small. Um, so that's, that's the reason that the shells or one of the reasons that it's so expensive is they're very small pieces, but it also takes us six months to tan it and finish it properly. So it's very, very expensive. A lot of work to make such a small thing oh somebody's home uh and the biggest reason that you can't make a one-piece belt is because the shell cordovan is uh not long so there are some animals like mules and donkeys and zebras that actually have a continuous membrane across their entire backside uh, where we're all able to get those one-piece belts maybe 50 a year um <laughs> my wife's home um, but that's really not possible. So what Nick and Skip do is they bogart those for themselves and make them into special projects because otherwise they would just get made into boots. So they like to make something special every now and then. So I'd say we get maybe uh, 50 to 100 one-piece belts every year, but often you have to make them out of three pieces because of those smaller ovals. You take one larger piece in the middle and then two little tabs on the side to finish the belt off. So hopefully that answers your question, Robert. 
All right. Let's see. Anybody else got any questions? Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that worked. Um, I'm trying to work out a belt for myself that uh, and we've actually been trying different options for a few years to make a shell belt. And it seems like the only way to actually make it feasible is to, the, to do a three-piece belt. But what I don't like about the existing shell belts is how they stack them. Um, often you'll see the three-piece belts where, where they'll put a layer on top of another layer and then sew it down. And I think what happens is this part starts to separate after a while. And it kind of looks lame, like when this flips up. So we're gonna we're we've been experimenting with different types of stitching and different types of construction. And we're gonna try to make a three-piece dress shell belt ourselves, which I think is gonna be a really big deal. Um because a lot of people come come to us asking for shell belts and we just can't do it, and it makes me sad. <laughs> so I want to keep doing that. But let's see. Um, I have so much beer left, so I failed at the <laughs> the uh, drinking part of drinking leather. But I think we did a lot of leathering. <laughs> so um, if anybody has suggestions on stouts or porters, I would love new stouts or porters to try. But I also need some suggestions on bourbons because I'm sort of a layperson with bourbon, and I want to get more into it. So. If you have questions there, let me know. And then I'm going to try to do this again next week with a different drink, with a different pair of shoes, with some different topics to chat about. So hopefully you guys will stay in touch. I know this, I'm only able to do this sort of random times because I've got too much stuff going on. Um, but I really like chatting with you, Robert. So thanks so much for bringing the questions. And anybody else that wants to chat too, we'll chat again next time. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later.